The first of our loudest salawats in honor of the greatest man to walk this earth, Al Habib Al Mustafa Muhammad. A second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al Hawra Al Batulati Fatima. And the third in honor of our Imam, Imam Sahib Al Asri, was Zaman with your loudest voices. Now the verse in question we chose to look into in this tragic night and it's the night of the 10th of the calamity of Karbala in order to look at the position of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman on this night and the importance that this figure has on each and every one of our lives. That's number one. Number two, we'd like to look at this particular verse in an instance where we look at the actual concept of a person crying tears instead of blood for mourning. Now, in order to look at the significance of this aspect, we're going to look at a couple of steps where we can firstly look at the importance of the Prophet. Then we're going to look at the importance of Amir al Mu'mineen. We want to see the relevance, firstly, the prophets that came throughout time. Our prophet, where his position is in reference to the others. Then we'd look at, did the prophet of Islam, did the prophet of Islam stay there and then? Or did he carry this message? Did his knowledge pass on towards the imams to safeguard the message of Islam? Or didn't his message and his characteristics and his knowledge passed down towards the Imams. And if it did pass down to the Imams, what importance does this have on us? So we're going to ask, we're going to answer one question that many of the brothers have repeatedly asked. And that question is, did the skies really bleed for Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram? And that's the main question we're going to answer tonight. Then we'll take it into the context, which is to do with Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman in that particular line in Ziyarat Nahiya. Now, as we know, Ziyarat Nahiya, the complete name is Ziyarat from Nahiya al muqaddasa meaning we've attained this particular dua, which is very mustahab to recite on each night in Muharram for the first the graphic content. Now, arguably, when you take a piece of dua and you recite it when we looked at it yesterday, there's a certain aspect of humbleness that we feel. There's a certain aspect in which we can look at ourselves, reflect, try to humble ourselves, look at the greatness of the Creator, try to replenish ourselves, ask Allah for forgiveness. When we get to Ziyarat Nahiya, the first thing you will look at is apart from the aspect in which Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman is the one that's actually narrating this. There's a very graphic content that we have to look at. Very graphic content. Now if anyone's come, and inshallah all of us have recited or read or listened to Ziyarat Nahi, we'll find the actual graphics that the Imam tries to allude to us in the illustration that he put in Ziyarat Nahi. Now, this particular verse that we want to look at, the way we're going to look at it is looking at the importance of the prophets, our prophets, the imams until the final messenger, Messiah. The final imam, which is prescribed in each and every religion, one way or another, to bring justice and eradicate tyranny. Now, inshallah, to start the topic for tonight, please assist me. In reciting a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Our Prophet on many occasions has been given a significant role, a significant status. Just looking at the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named him to be the Khatim, the final Prophet that brought forth the complete religion is in itself enough to say that he was the greatest man to ever live. 
other aspects that we've discussed during these series of lectures was that he was the only prophet to be the prophet for both jinn and ins. Knowing and having knowledge of both their sharias. And he attained such a rank in which even Jibra'il, when he was taking him and he ascended, in Mi'raj, there was a place that even the angels couldn't go. When Jibra'il comes and says, I can't go further than this particular place because I will burn alive. Only you, O Prophet of Islam, can take these steps. And that's when we read, he was closer than two bow arrow, uh, arrowheads to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one instance. The second instance we read on many occasions, Hadith al-Kisa, when Allah tells his angels, he says, I would not have created firstly this sky, nor would I have created the earth, nor will I have created the universe, plural universes, he says, or the planets, or the stars, or these rivers, or these trees. And he says, if it was not for these people that are under the Kisa. And then they ask him, who is it? That's under that particular kisa. And the reply comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hum Fatima wa abiha wa ba'liha wa baniha. Other narrations that come forth and state, Lawlaq by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Hadith Qus it says, Lawlaq lama khalaqtu al-aflaq. If it wasn't for you, O Prophet of Islam, I would not have created the universes. Or the galaxies, if we want to look at it in the correct translation. And if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have created Ali. If it wasn't for Ali, I wouldn't have created you. And if it wasn't for Fatima al Zahra, look at the status. I would not have created either one of you. Now, on the first instance, we could look at the importance of the Prophet and we acknowledge that he is the final messenger, the greatest man to walk this earth with the height of morality, the height of knowledge. The height of status. Anything you want to have a reference point, the Prophet of Islam. Now, the question arises, did he or did he not pass that knowledge down towards Ali ibn Abi Talib? Did he or did he not pass that which Allah taught him to safeguard the message to the safekeepers of the message after him? The Imams. Let's look at it in a context. When Ali ibn Abi Talib is asked on many occasions, and we have to remember in the school of, in the, in the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, it's never a good thing to always compare and contrast. Compare and contrast infallibles. Was this prophet greater? Was this prophet greater? Was this imam greater than this imam? Was this imam greater than this imam? But there's many narrations that allude to particular factors. And I'm going to mention some of those narrations tonight. To see that how it alludes to us, did or didn't the Messenger of Islam teach or give his knowledge towards Amir al Mu'mineen? And on the second level, did Amir al Mu'mineen apply that knowledge or not? Let's look at it. So we're comparing Ali ibn Abi Talib with the Prophet of Islam. Let's look at it. Let's look at the people that we look at at an important level. The father of creation, let's say, Adam. Let's compare him towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. And many occasions Ali is asked, Amir al muminin is asked, are you greater or is this prophet? Are you great or is this prophet? And when he's asked about Adam, look at his reply. He says, Adam ate from a tree that he was advised not to go near. He says, except for Ali ibn Abi Talib, that which Allah has prescribed for me to be lawful, I stay away from, so I may train myself. First comparison, Adam, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Second comparison, Nabi Allah, Nuh. He says, Nuh, after preaching towards his qawm, after preaching, he took an instance where he says, that's enough. I've had enough. They will never come towards the message. Oh Allah, shower your punishment now. Ali ibn, Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, except for Ali ibn Abi Talib, 
No matter how long I live for, I will never stop and say it's enough of preaching. They will never come. Two, Nuh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Three, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. What's the comparison? He says, in reference to Ibrahim, he asked Allah, and focus on this point. He says, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show him how he resurrects the dead, not because he doesn't believe, but to increase his yaqeen, his certainty. Three levels of certainty. We have to remember, side note, three levels of certainty. Alm, ayn, haq. Alm al meaning the knowledge of certainty. I may have knowledge of death, first level of certainty. Then there's ayn al -yaqeen. When you see that particular act with your own eyes, you increase in a level of certainty. When you see someone die, you've increased in a level of certainty because you've seen it. You had knowledge, now you've seen it. Third level of certainty is what? Is when you go through it. Haqq al isn't it? The essence of certainty. When you die yourself, your, your first-hand perspective of what death is, that's the final level of certainty. So Ibrahim had knowledge that Allah can resurrect the dead. So he asks Allah, can you show me so that I may increase in a level of certainty? Ali ibn Talib says, that's what he asked Allah. He says, if it was for me, if Allah removes the veils, I would not increase nor would I decrease in certainty that I have. Look at the level that Ali ibn Talib has reached because of what the Prophet has taught him. I think we need to pray. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I think in every instance that we remember, we look at the status, it's beautiful to recite that dua when we send our blessings to the Prophet and his progeny. Now, on the next instance, we look at Musa. We're looking at the great prophets here in comparison to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Musa, what's the comparison? He says, Musa, he killed one person. He was, af he was afraid to go back. He told Allah, I've already killed the person. I'm afraid to go back. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, when chapter 9 of the Holy Quran was revealed, and the Prophet said, go and reveal this to Quraysh. He says, I knew very well that there wasn't a household except was mourning a death of someone that I killed in the battles. But I never hesitated for a second to go back to Quraysh to reveal this verse from the Holy Quran. Surah At-Tawbah. Musa. Isa. Look at this beautiful tradition. He says, Isa. Mind you, he never says in any instance that I'm greater. He's letting our minds think for themselves. The Ahlul Bayt always wanted us to think, to contemplate, to understand. They don't spoon feed us everything, no. But even the things that they spoon feed us, we often don't even take from them. That's not the topic for tonight. The topic for tonight is to look at the greatness of our Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Now, Isa, what's the comparison? He says, Look at his mother, look at my mother. He says, When Isa ibn, Mar when Isa ibn Maryam was born, Allah gave the message or the sign to his mother Maryam to go outside the Holy Land to give birth to Isa, isn't it? He says, but look how Allah has honored me. He opened his house, the Kaaba, and told my mother give birth to Ali ibn Abi Talib inside. Now when he gives us a comparison with the Prophet of Islam, what does he say? He says, Ana abdun min abidi Muhammad. Therefore, there is an instance that there is a comparison when we look at the Prophet of Islam. The person that followed in his footsteps, every single footstep he followed in was Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's why we follow him. Because no one followed the Prophet like Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
That's why when we hold on to Ali ibn Abi Talib, it's holding on to the Prophet of Islam, isn't it? Now, that's the first instance. Someone may come and say, I need more evidence stating that the Prophet taught Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, we have a narration stating by Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allemani Rasulullah al-Fabab tuftah min kulli bab al-Fabab. In another tradition, in which the Shaykh narrated to us a few nights ago, from every door opens a thousand thousand doors. So thousand doors, each one opens a million, you have the calculations with you. Knowledge from the Prophet passed down. We want more Sayyid, I'll bring more. Let's look at a particular verse from the Holy Quran when we looked at the jinn in the time of Sulaiman. Sulaiman asks, who can bring me the throne of Balqis? Jinn gets up, I'll bring it before you sit down. Then what does the Holy Quran state? He said, the Quran states, look at the beauty and the perfection of Quran. Look at the perfection. The Quran states that a person that had knowledge from the book, ilmun min al-kitab, knowledge from, not knowledge of the book, from the book, he could bring a throne on the other side of the world before Suleiman blinks. Knowledge from the book. Surah Al-Ra'ad, 13th chapter in the Holy Quran. The last ayah, ayah 43 states that, O oh Rasulullah, it's enough that Allah is a witness and the one that has knowledge of the book. Who has knowledge of the book? Someone that has knowledge from the book brings the throne of Balqis from the other side of the world in a blink of an eye. What power does a person or what knowledge and what has Allah given at the disposal of the person that has knowledge of the book? Let's look at the traditions. The person, and we know there's something called Allah's greatest name which is comprised of 73 letters. 70 how much? 73 letters is consisting of Allah's greatest name. The person that had knowledge from the book had one letter. One letter. Let's look at our prophets. In our traditions, Ibrahim had eight letters. Eight letters, eight letters of Allah's greatest name was with Ibrahim. Musa, three. Isa, two. The Prophet of Islam. You ask Imam al-Baqir, how many of Allah's greatest names, or the letters of Allah's greatest name, did the Prophet of Islam have? Out of the 73, the Prophet of Islam, and this shows you the significance of our Prophet, 72 out of the 73 letters of Allah's greatest name was with the Prophet of Islam. Now when, the, when Ali ibn Talib comes and says, عَلَّمَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهَ أَلْفَبَابٍ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ تُفْتَحُ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابٍ أَلْفَبَابٍ means that if he has 72, names of Allah, or 72 letters of the greatest name of Allah, Imam al-Baqir states that those letters were taught to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, when the first Khalifa goes to the Prophet of Islam and asks him, who in the Quran has knowledge from the book, and who in the Quran has knowledge of the book, he says the person that has knowledge from the book, one letter of Allah's greatest name, was the wasi of Sulaiman Asif bin Barkhia. The person on the tongue of the Prophet that had the knowledge of the book, 72 out of the 73 letters of Allah's greatest name was none other than Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. So you can't come and say, well, Let's rank Ali ibn Abi Talib here with this particular person that sat on the pulpit or this person that's... 
You compare Ali with prophets, not khalifas. Messengers, people that Allah has handpicked, not people that sat in a circle and picked them for themselves. And that's why we find a person, which is not from our school of thought, saying, and he's narrating the story. He says, once the second khalifa walked past a person which cursed him. He had him prosecuted and whipped and whipped. And he says, Ali ibn Abi Talib goes past pulpits which do la'na to him. The pulpits of Muawiyah. And he turns around and says, may Allah guide them. He says, that's the difference, that's the difference between Allah's chosen man and a man chosen by me, mortals. That's the difference. Morality. Knowledge. Application. Now, where does this take us in the aspect where we can look at the greatness of the prophets, of the imams, of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, and the tragedy of Karbala? Where does this all link? Did or didn't the skies weep blood? Was it a metaphorical level, meaning did it just rain? Meaning it's tears, or did it actually rain blood? It's an interesting question. And it's a question that's always asked. Is it true? Is it not true? Is it true? Is it not true? Imam al-Askari, there's a tradition, beautiful tradition. Imam al-Askari, once there was a fitna at the time. He was under house arrest by the Abbasid Khalifa of the time. Under house arrest, there was a fitna. When there was a drought at the time of Imam al-Askari. Absolute drought. So the Muslims came together and they said, you know what, just like Imam al radas time, people came out to perform Salat al-Istisqa. We pray to Allah to rain, to bless us with the rain. We'll do it likewise. But we won't use the Imam of the time. We want to show people how we can do it without the Imam. How foolish can you be? They go out, the Muslims, with the Abbasid Khalifa at the time, and they all gather together and they pray towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let it rain. Oh Allah, let it rain. Oh Allah, let it rain. Doesn't rain. Then a Christian man comes. He says, if I pray and I make it rain, you have to come towards Christianity. They said, well, if we, didn't, if we prayed, it doesn't rain. How can a Christian come forth and he prays, it becomes a fitna, doesn't it? Even though if we don't believe, that's the aspect that people say that it's two different aspects. Christianity, Judaism, all the religions that had a book are part of Islam. If you don't believe in Isa, you're not a Muslim. If you don't believe in Musa, you're not a Muslim. But when we're looking at these perspectives, that we're talking about people that didn't believe in the Prophet of Islam, even though the Bible says there will be a last messenger, which is Al-Habib Al-Mustafa Muhammad. Now, Christian comes forth. He raises his hands and he says, I ask Allah, or I ask God, in honor of Jesus, to let it rain. Raises his hands the skies begin to rain. Everyone's looking at the Khalifa of the time. Oh, Abbas at Khalifa, what's going on? The Muslims are praying, no rain. Christian man comes and it's pouring. He says, I have no answer. He says, where can we go? Where's the answer? This is a great fitna, it's a calamity. So he says, well, we'll have to utilize the Imam of our time. Have to. You can go anywhere. You'll come back. Imam Sadiq says, There is not a rock that you lift except you'll find our knowledge under it. You have to come back towards Ahl al Bayt. One way or another. All the knowledge we have now chemistry, sciences, linguists, anything root was the Ahl al Bayt. The root was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His messengers. And we can derive little bits here and there. 
and we think ourselves to be knowledgeable. So they go towards the Imam of the time, Imam al Askari. They told him of the situation. He says, It's very simple. They're like, Hold on, how is it simple? How's it simple? He says, I'll tell you. He says, that Christian man, next time he lifts his hand, tell him to do it again. Next time he lifts his hand, I want you to grab his arm. Inside, you'll find a bone. Remove that bone and cover it. Make sure it's not unveiled under the sky. So that's a strange request, but we'll do it. So they brought the Christian again. They said, we'll believe in you if you can redo that miracle that you did. He says, not a problem. Muslims come. The Christians come. Muslims pray. No rain. So they're watching the Christian man. The Christian man's lifting his hands. Grab his hands. So the Christian man lifts his hand. They grab his hand. And truthfully enough, they find a bone. Quickly, they grab the bone and cover it with some cloth so it's not unveiled under the sky. And they tell him, pray now. So the person's praying, he's praying, he's praying. No rain. So they go back and look at the beauty of this narration and the impact it has with tonight's topic. Let's look at the beauty of this narration. They go back towards Imam al-Askari. And they ask him, how is it that you knew that this bone would allow the skies to cry. Look at what he says. Look at the reference with which we have. Did or didn't the skies weep blood? So he says, it's very simple. This bone, I need everyone to pay very close attention to this point. He says, this bone is the bone of a prophet. Now, he says, when a bone of a prophet is unveiled under the skies, it begins to rain. The question I ask is if a bone of a normal prophet, when unveiled under the skies, allows it to rain, how about the bone, the blood, and the flesh of the greatest prophet lying on the plains of Karbala. That's the question I need you all to contemplate over. When we have the example of the bone of a normal prophet, unveiled at cries, Imam Hussein in the state that he was in, would or wouldn't the skies weep blood? Let's look at traditions. We're not taking any from our books tonight. No tradition from our books. Every reference I'm going to say tonight, and it's recorded. You go over, look at it, whenever you want to use this. First, there is a tradition in a sawa'iq al muhriqa from, it's a long tradition, it has many aspects, from page 116 to page 192. The first tradition, it states that the, the redness in the sky, look what the tradition says. You see, Maghrib time, whenever the sky goes, whenever the sun goes down, you find there's a redness in the sky, isn't it? So Waqq al Muharqa states that redness in the sky was never known towards the Muslims before the tragedy of Karbala. One, two, three traditions. The first, again, so Waqq al Muharqa, page 116 to 192. The second is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Volume 9, page 162. Then we have Tathkirat al-Khawas, page 284. All stating one aspect. On the day of the tragedy of Karbala, there was not a rock that was lifted except that they found blood underneath. Not from our traditions from other schools of thought. Now, someone comes and says, well, this is, at the end of the day, historical books. They're from Muslim sources, if you want to call it that. Can you bring me someone that's not Muslim, that has nothing to do with Muharram, nothing to do with Imam Hussein? 
and give me a reference that I can tell people outside the school of Islam. Go open a book, historical book. A person doesn't know about Islam altogether. He's in Britain, a historian. He writes a book and he names it the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. In it, every year, he writes the significant aspects that happened. Now, 61 after Hijra is when Imam Hussein was, mar was murdered. Now, when 61 after Hijra, when we related to AD after death, in the other calendar, it goes hand in hand with 685 AD. 61 after Hijra, 685 AD. Let's look at the only point that he mentions in that year that was significant. All the other years, there's many things mentioned. That year, one significant thing was mentioned. Britain, not Iraq. Britain, historian, not Muslim. He says the only thing the people remember from that year is that the skies rained blood and all the milk and the dairy products such as butter turned into blood. Now I want to ask you, where is any person going to come forth from the Shia school of thought and write it into that book. And the reason that there's no connection whatsoever, I haven't mentioned any references from our books, Sunni books, Sunni historical books, and a historical book about someone that doesn't have anything to do with Islam whatsoever. When someone asks, did the skies weep blood on the 10th of Muharram, or did they not? This is the answer that you must answer. These are the references that you have. Now, the topic tonight, what relevance does it have to Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman? Because when we look at Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman stating that I will cry for you instead of tears, blood. Someone say it's a metaphorical level. No. It's not a metaphorical level. When someone, when you look at the actual physiology, I don't want to get into too much detail about the names of each gland and what produces what. But the main aspect is blood is the main reason. Or it has an effect in which it will allow a gland to produce your tears. If this is overused, it may be damaged. If it's damaged, it doesn't take the cycle in which it changes. That way you will begin to cry blood. And there's many aspects. And many things that they try to name, diseases, whatever you want to call it, that people actually cry blood. And they don't know the reason behind it. And it's so damaging that it may allow you to lose your eyesight. And we know from the example in the Quran, when the father of Yusuf keeps crying and the crying and crying, he loses his eyesight, doesn't he? It's very damaging. Now when the Imam comes and says that it's such a significant calamity that I put my eyesight in danger. Remember, the Imam, which is now why the earth is still rotating. If we look at Hadith Al-Kisa, all the messages that Allah has produced, that has come forth, which is Islam, all come down to this one man that will bring justice and eradicate tyranny. Now if this man cries blood instead of tears, what do we have to commemorate Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman When he puts everything on the line, how much do we offer from our time to pray and follow in his footsteps? From our time to learn about this great man? From our time from Muharram to Muharram, how much will we change to follow in the footsteps of his companions? To learn from them, to become of the companions 
of Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman We look at extremes. The blood of the Imam has those 72 letters, letters of Allah's greatest name embedded into it. And it cries for Aba Abdullah. The skies cry for Aba Abdullah. The rocks cry for Aba Abdullah. Metaphorically, no. Literally. Let's, on this night, take it upon ourselves to cry tears to what? To purify our souls. Let's take this opportunity from tonight being the final night and tomorrow being the tragedy. Purify ourselves. Make a covenant with Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman that next year I want to be at such a better position in your eyes that you may consider me to be of your companions. Let's create that connection with our Imam, brothers and sisters. And because this is the final night, and we look at the importance and the position of the Imam, imagine what he's going through right now. Imagine what he's, he'll be going through tomorrow on the day of the calamity of Karbala. Let's try to commemorate this tragedy alongside Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Let's try to commemorate this calamity with Sayyida Fatima. And when we commemorate with someone, when we want to be hand in hand with someone, we don't want to be saying one thing and following in one footstep, and from the other angle, we're backstabbing them. Because one of us, we can come forth and say that we are with you, o Imam. Turn your face away from the Husseiniyat and look at our A'mal. We want to be in one ground. The Quran states there is no two hearts in the one body. We can't love the Imam, do that which he loves. And in the same manner, we do that which the Imam hates and his enemies love. That's what we have to remember, brothers and sisters. So we pray to Allah on this occasion, on the last night. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to understand the position of the Imam. Allows us to become closer with our Imam. Allows us to understand what he's going through in order that we can help him in his mourning. And allow him to come quicker by allowing ourselves to become better and be a part of his army. And I've been requested, brothers and sisters... We have to pray for the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. Al-ahya minhum wal-amwat. And in a special reference, and I've been told there was a brother yesterday that out of nowhere suffered a stroke. And he requested on many occasions that we recite uh, the ayah in which we can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his majesty to allow this person to have better health and to regain his consciousness. And inshallah, our voices will be raised to the skies and will be accepted, inshallah, brothers and sisters. For everyone, the mu'mineen, the mu'minat, the person that we just mentioned, inshallah, we can, we can pray all together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amman yujibu al-muftar idha da'a wa yakshifu su أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء اكشف عن السوء والبلاء يا الله Brothers and sisters, inshallah If there's anything that I've said that's wrong, it's from me And if anything that I've said that's right, it's from Allah And the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt So please forgive me if I've said anything that has hurt any one of you And inshallah we can help each other become elevated in the eyes of Allah. 
And inshallah, we can end with a surah al mubarak al fatiha But before it, three of your loudest salawats, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.